Ancestral beings are the very building blocks of many aboriginal societies. They come in many shapes, sizes, and forms. They could be the spirit of a dead loved one, the forefathers of a nation, or even animal spirit beings. Others become guardian angels and are passed into the individuals before birth. Some ancestral beings are direct descendant relatives, while others date back to the creation of the world itself. Some cultures enshrine their ancestors in art, statues, and even use their very bodies, bones, hair, ashes, relics. In Madagascar, ancestral beings are honored in a ceremony called Fama Diana, where they cover the dead in beautiful silk garments and celebrate the funeral as a festival. Young girls even take pieces of the dead ancestors' garments as a good luck charm to help increase pregnancy there. This is very similar to how the Catholic Church would keep relics of the saints. I used to go to a St. Thomas Catholic Church that actually had a relic of a small piece of robe that St. Thomas wore. This was very close to the saints who have died. Through the practice of prayer and asking God as well as our ancestors for help, there was a connection between the relic and prayer itself. Other societies, such as in Africa or India, believe that ancestral beings could enter into animal flesh or inanimate objects after death, all referring to transmigration or reincarnation of the soul or spirit into a new body, a new life. These ancestral beings are almost known to all cultures on earth, perhaps through ghost stories or a sixth sense. Perhaps we can feel them around us, or even the spirits of nature itself at times. Oftentimes the ancestral beings are thought to return to the land after they die. One example of these ancestral stories is the Miri, or the Miriula dog. The weary jury aboriginals of Australia and Wales believe this small spirit dog had growing red eyes and lots of fur. It would often come out right out of the water as the sun was going down. There are many stories of the Miri dog following people home at night only to disappear when they got home. Other tales of the Miri dog described it in a more scarier feeling as a bigger dog that would appear and disappear right in front of them. In another story of the ancestral spirit, the Aborig Aborigines of Australia speak of the rainbow serpent. Perhaps to a Christian this may refer to worshipping Satan or the deceiver in the Garden of Eden who caused mankind to fall. However, to the Australian Aborigine, this story speaks of the serpent as an ancestral being who created life itself, who gives life, who takes life, and even blesses people. The Aboriginals of Australia believe the rainbow serpent is moving from one watering hole to another when a rainbow is in the sky. Either way, from the believable to the unbelievable, these stories of ancestral beings are a story of the circle of life, the circle of death, a connection to the dead, a connection to our ancestors, to angels, to the mystery of life, and where we are going. One of the most famous paintings from the turn of the 20th century was Paul Gogwin's piece, Where Do We Come From? What are we? Where are we going? Like all Aboriginal art, this speaks directly about a circle of life. 
This piece is speaking of creation, living in the present, and the future, including death itself. This piece alone was painted on a heavy sackcloth, an image that is reference to ancestry and the daily life of the Tahiti people. Gogwin, a French Catholic artist and explorer, even stated himself that this painting not only surpassed all of his past paintings, but also will be his best ever, with nothing like it. This painting was so deep and passionate to Gogwin that it is believed he went into the mountains shortly after and attempted to end his life in Van Gogh-like fashion. This painting has so many subtle hints reflecting the mystery of life and death itself. Like a language that should be read backwards, Gogwin left instructions that the painting should be looked at left to right. Starting at a baby and ending at an old woman itself. Gogwin even wrote about the painting. The people within it appear to be floating in space itself. Instead of being rooted upon the ground, perhaps referencing their spiritual side, or the realization that this world is not the end. And this could be summed up by the great blue statue in the background on the left, which symbolizes the beyond as well as the totality of life itself. Even the child eating the apple over the blue statue shows our need for spirituality. The dog on the right shows a sense of humanity. And the bird on the left next to the old woman shows we are headed for the afterlife. Recently, as an aspiring artist, I created a change rendition of a Paul Gogwin piece entitled The Cow in the Seascape. The Cow in the Seascape was a piece by Paul Gogwin, which actually sold to help fund his trip to Tahiti, for which Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? was created. This piece by Gogwin was focused on the bright contrasting colors, orange, green, red. In the bottom corner, you can see a haystack, for which the simple black and white of a cow, which is beginning to leave the canvas. Although these may not have intended to be spiritual, when I look at it, I see life and death itself. Perhaps the rock formation on the left appears somewhat scaly, like a snake a symbol of death and mortality, as you can see the scaly texture. Perhaps the rocky terrain in the top right shows the stubbornness of a bull or an ox, which has lots of spiritual meaning. And of course, who can miss the giant green dragon hidden in the field in the middle of the painting? Yet to this day, these animal elements have been hidden from the mainstream art media in this painting, as perhaps they were kept a secret. In my rendition, I bought upon some of the same textures, same spiritual essences that Gogwin was referencing in his work, in a very bright and colorful piece. While it keeps the simple landscape headed into the background, it is full of hidden, hidden animal meanings and shows some of the life and death in the same sense of Gogwin's seascape with the cow. I view the bright reddish-orange haystack more of a shepherd in the bottom right as the good shepherd Jesus giving life to his church. There are numerous hidden birds, some with crowns, a squirrel, three horses on the left, one has a heart nose, an elephant sits above them, a ram whose horn takes the place of Gogwin's boat, perhaps you can even find the aborigine blowing brown smoke hidden in the ram on the right. Gogwin's seascape piece, as well as my tribute rendition, and who are we, and where are we going, ask the same question in a poetic form. 
Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we headed? This figure is called a Yipwan. It comes from the Karawari people of New Guinea. This is a very interesting piece because of the whole story behind it. It talks about spirits called the Yipwan, who were a creation of the sun itself. The sun came down to the earth looking to carve a musical drum. While it was carving the drum, pieces of wood fell to the ground and it is said that they turned into Yipwan spirits. However, after the Yipwan spirits formed, they killed one of the son's relatives, which angered the moon and caused the Yipwan spirits to run into a temple and hide and become wood statues. These statues are mass reproduced and dated back to the 19th, 20th centuries, possibly even older. The Yipwan has a large human head it is made with a big forehead and a long beard, which portray a mature age. It is made with only one foot, showing a two-dimensional form. But perhaps the most interesting part of the Yipwam is not his two-dimensional form, but is the ribs, which are formed horizontally outward instead of vertically upward. These ribs are shown in a skeletal form, like hooks. And this skeletal form suggests death itself. And it suggests spirituality. as if these beings have a sense of life after death. In the middle of these hooks, and usually there are six hooks found on these statues, there is a central cage, which is believed to be a center for a heart or a soul showing the spiritual side of the sculpture. But these yip wands were not only used for house ornaments to house the spirits of the yip wand. They were also used to invoke the yip wand spirits for hunting. Although it may not be physical evidence, the Yimam cultures, the Karawari of Papua New Guinea, would turn to the Yipwan for endurance and strength before going to battle or hunting. Selected leaders would perform ceremonies to stir up the spirit in the sculpture. It is said the Yipwan spirit would then possess one of the hunters and speak to let the tribe know if it was pleased with its hunting plans. If the spirit was pleased, it is believed the Yipwam would travel to the village that the Karawari were going to raid and kill the spirits of their enemies, making the bodies easier to kill in war. After a raid, the Karawari would rub the blood and body parts of the enemies and the animals they killed on the statue as an offering to appease the Yipwam spirits.